Thank you, everybody, for your presentations. And I have the honor to introduce our first uh, invited speaker. Uh, she's uh, Laura Zanardini. She studied uh, here at Politecnico di Milano, aerospace engineer. And uh, she is currently the Columbus module flight director that oversees the operations of astronauts like uh, uh, Alex Gerst and uh, Tim Peake on board of the International Space Station Scientific Laboratory. She specialized in uh, human spaceflight operations and uh, she worked for the Italian uh, Space Agency at the NASA Johnson Space Center. And uh, she was also involved uh, in the Space uh, Shuttle mission. So everybody, uh, uh, <laughs> Laura Zanardi. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I have the not so nice task of waking you up on a Saturday morning and let you skip your coffee break. So I'll try to be entertaining. It's not my best suit, but uh, the argument is quite cool. So I hope uh, you will forgive me. Let's see if. OK. So I've never flown to space, but actually my picture has. So this picture was taken by Alex Gerst in the cupola and on board the International Space Station. So some parts of me have been there, which is actually quite cool. Um, as Stefania said, I studied here together with her. Uh, I graduated uh, almost 10 years ago when this place was uh, much more crappier <laughs> than it is now. No fancy rooms and uh, quite small, but uh, still nice. And then I was lucky enough to have my first working experience in the Johnson Space Center at NASA. I worked there as an Italian Space Agency liaison officer and for the multipurpose logistic module, which is uh, one of the modules that was flying back and forth inside the shuttle to bring uh, supplies to the space station and has now been uh, uh, outfitted as a permanent module, so it's now attached to the space station and used as a storage room. Uh, unfortunately, as you know, Obama decided it was not a good idea to keep uh, flying shuttles, so I had to find a backup solution for my life. Uh, and uh, I moved to the amazing city of Oberwaffenhofen, uh, where I became a flight controller first, and I did uh, some system engineering for the Columbus module. And uh, uh, since February last year, I work as a flight director. Uh, all this. Uh, Names and positions are not making too much sense to you at the moment, but the goal of today is uh, that you leave this room and you will know what's a Columbus, what's a flight director, what is a system, and uh, all this type of information, hopefully. So let's start with something you all know. I remember some hashtags where Samantha Cristoforetti, so probably in the last few months, you have been bombarded on Italian television with a picture of her or Luca Parmitano. So these are the <coughs> most recent uh, uh, ESA astronauts that were selected in 2009. They have all flown to the International Space Station, except one who is the bottom right guy, our French astronaut. But uh, in uh, so 10 days uh, or so, he will start his mission. Uh, he's supposed to uh, launch on the 17th of November. So this is all just to say uh, they have all done six missions on board, uh, so six months missions on board the space station, except uh, the Danish astronaut uh, who did uh, only 10 days, in which uh, anyway he completed as much science uh, as the others in six months. So. It was also easy. So this is all to say that these are our uh, currently most active astronauts. There are still others, uh, including uh, our Italian uh, uh, friend Paolo Naspoli, who are supposed to fly again in the near future. Um, but uh, just what they are and uh, where do they go is here. So you all probably know exactly what that is. Uh, our uh, biggest project uh, of uh, human uh, uh, space flight and uh, is uh, 
just to give you some uh, facts, uh, it's as big as a football field, an American football field. Every 90 minutes is orbiting around Earth, and uh, yeah, it's as big as a hotel, five-star hotel. There are six rooms. One has a window, but it's reserved for the Russian commander. So not very much options for that. Two bathrooms, uh, and uh, the rest is uh, pretty much uh, dedicated to science. So Columbus is uh, what you see on the bottom right, um, the one with the ESA sticker, so it's quite recognizable. And it's uh, the scientific laboratory. Um, I will get more on that. Of course, this was not uh, launched as it is now. The first flight to assemble the International Space Station was uh, in 1998, and the last one was in 2011, of course, the last uh, shuttle mission, because, uh, as you can imagine, launching big modules or thrusts of the uh, solar array is not that easy with uh, a Soyuz or a small rocket. Um, the project is coming out of five space agencies, NASA, Russian Space Agency, Canadian Space Agency, who did the robotic arm, the Japanese Space Agency, and the European Space Agency. And uh, we recently celebrated the 16th anniversary of uh, human presence in continuously in the International Space Station. So I think I was on console a couple of days ago. Uh, they made a quite a cool speech about the fact that for 16 years there have been people living on the International Space Station. And so far, 224 people have been there. So not so many. Let's see if, okay. So this, is, this quick video will show you how the whole thing was assembled. I hope. Okay, let's try. Okay. Oh, okay. Let's try. Let's start again. Okay, so first uh, part was a Russian module joined by an American one, so it's one to one. Then uh, another Russian and another part of the American. Uh, so starting from here, the crew was uh, composed only by two crew members. And then uh, uh, when it became bigger with uh, more uh, resources, uh, they went up to three crew members. And currently, we are having uh, six as a baseline. And sometimes even uh, uh, we had more busier period with shuttle and uh, recently with some other uh, flights with up to nine people. This is the airlock to do uh, extravehicular activities, uh, some other Russian components. You see each piece was basically a dedicated shuttle flight for the US parts. So it took uh, 13 years to build the whole thing. And on the bottom, you can see with the time frame. Here is 2002. 2006. Sometimes uh, there were pauses because we had some, uh, as you all know, some accident and they stopped the whole activities for a while. But it's still going. And 2007, it starts looking a bit more as a quite big outpost. Um, some relocations of modules. Uh, and so then comes Columbus, 2008. The Japanese module, one part. Um, the robotic arm, the other Japanese big module. And finally, the masterpiece of the whole thing is the permanent multipurpose module, of course. And uh, if you want to be proud of your country, 
more, of, uh, more than 50% of the pressurized volume has been built in Italy, mostly by Itales. So, and yeah, this is basically the whole composition. Unfortunately, as said, at the moment we can just carry small uh, rack inside or new experiment, but nothing else who can be put outside. Okay. So. Um, okay, so the organization of the whole uh, uh, human presence in space is not that simple. Um, there are charts like this one who are integrating uh, which astronauts are going up. Uh, since there are a few uh, rules, there should always be a commander, there should always be a Russian piloting the Soyuz. Uh, in between you have to fit international partner flights because of course their contribution needs to be paid back. Uh, um, you have a, a visiting vehicle uh, bringing experiments. The experiments need to be timed with the astronauts who have been trained to do the experiments. Uh, you have delays, you have problems, uh, so the whole uh, uh, integration is uh, summarized here. Um, important part are port utilization. Of course, you have to time uh, where your vehicles are docking uh, because you don't want to get there and say, oh, I don't know where to put this Soyuz. Let me try again. <laughs> so uh, there are certain periods of the year where you cannot launch. For example, when the solar beta angle is higher than 60 degrees for thermal reasons. So this is also not possible. So if your astronauts are waiting for their experiments, which have to be done between uh, flight day 15 and flight day 30, and then you cannot launch, uh, it's another problem. So we have uh, an incredible high amount of people that are taking care of planning and uh, making sure that uh, everything is fitting. And this chart changes probably daily because of delays, Russian e problems, uh, um, a, any type of uh, small thing that is not ready might have a domino effect on everything. So they always write down uh, for a reference only because uh, they are not even sure what is happening the following day. But just to give you an idea where we are now, red line, so it means three astronauts on board, one American and two Russians. As I said, uh, uh, one European astronaut coming soon. This is the second one in the light green bar. Uh, together with uh, uh, an American one and a Russian. Um, some uh, information below, you can also see what extravehicular activities are planned. Of course, also these ones are uh, a big uh, amount of deal because you have to size the suit for the astronaut. Of course, you have the suits on board, but you change the size of the arms, the legs, uh, the torso, depending on who is using it. And also you have to make sure all the pieces they have to take out or install or move are available. So this is also there. You see in which Soyuz they're flying. So the crew of Toma will go up with 49S. And uh, uh, in the bottom part, uh, you see the visiting vehicle like uh, SpaceX and HTV, which is the Japanese one. In the Farther right, uh, in yellow, you see a very cool thing. is the first uh, SpaceX uh, uh, demo flight for the crew vehicle. So the first one will be launched without astronaut, but uh, uh, it's there, it's already in the plan, so we have OPSIS coming soon. What, what is happening right now? Of course, uh, um, the, the astronauts are identified with different roles. There should be only one commander who is responsible for um, safety and uh, is the final authority on board. Uh, at the moment is uh, Shane Kimborough, the NASA 
uh, commander. Until uh, approximately 10 days ago, I was a Russian astronaut who left. Uh, normally, the group of three astronauts do uh, six months duties. They can vary up five to seven, depending on their schedule. And so these are the, the three ones on board and the, the three ones coming. Uh, Peggy Whiston will become the commander after uh, Shane uh, um, in a few months. And they always have cool posters, so uh, the, the best one was the one with uh, dra them dressed as Matrix. Uh, and, and it was again with Peggy and she was uh, doing uh, all in black with all the green dots. So they have uh, quite some fans. There were some about pirates. This one is not that cool actually, but you know, NASA is running out of fantasy. <laughs> okay, so this one is an interesting one. Uh, this is uh, a day in the life uh, of an astronaut. I will try first to let the astronauts speak for this chart, and then I will tell you more about it. Let's see if my skills are getting better at this. You know, space operations at their best. Here it is. The bars. Oh, the bars. Volume. Here it is. The bars. Oh, the bars. These bars run my life. They control everything right here. This is what controls everything. The red line in the center, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, you probably can. The red line in the center is the current time. So it's five minutes after 7 a.m. It tells me if it's day or night. It tells me what I'm supposed to be doing. It tells me if, if I'm late or if I'm early, which rarely ever happens. Uh, it tells me if I have communication coverage. This has everything I need to know and I can look at my whole day by scrolling ahead. It tells me when I'm going to be getting email. It tells me everything. I mean, the bars, they just run your life. Then they go by so fast, you can't stop them. And the red line, no matter what I do, it just keeps moving and moving to the right. And I can't stop it. I just can't. Sorry. Sorry about that. I'm OK now. I'm fine. So anyway, these uh, bars tell you. Uh, you know what's coming up next. So I got some morning prep work, and we have a daily planning conference. So in between, I hope to squeeze in some breakfast. I don't know about you, but I really could use some coffee uh, to wake up this morning. So what do you? Yeah. So this is the example how loved are those bars by our astronauts. But unfortunately, this is uh, what it is. There is no way to change it. It's their agenda. So each astronaut is identified by his uh, role and name. This I took it a uh, couple of weeks ago when we still had six astronauts on board, and it was a bit cooler to watch. So as you see, they have uh, uh, some activities all together. The first blue box one is the morning conference that he was talking about. It's where you call them from each control center and you tell them the plan for the day, what was changed overnight, uh, what they will find in the plan, and if you have some uh, things that was breaking up overnight or things they have to do before starting their day. Um, then they basically go separate ways. The Russians, they do the Russian stuff, which is mostly also written in Russian, so we have absolutely no idea. Unless uh, they call and then you get the translation, so you can have a small understanding of what they're doing, but apparently they also do experiments, so... And, and they're very nice. I mean, they, they complain openly on the translation and they say like, I don't want to do this thing today, can you move it? Yes. And our uh, 
European and American colleagues are a bit friendlier and they try to stick to the plan and uh, do what is there. Um, so, yeah, the, the colors help you understand uh, what activities are belonging to the same experiment or they should be done in sequence. Uh, um, yeah, then this is uh, a regular day for the crew uh, up to the sixth line. Uh, in the evening, there is again another conference to wrap up the day and uh, see what has gone right, what has gone wrong, and uh, uh, if they have uh, missed to do something, uh, we take notes and uh, we, we take it for the next days. Uh, in the middle, they have a break uh, for a midday meal. This is the only one that is scheduled. Breakfast and dinner, they do it in their free time. They work, uh, I mean, they're hard working, but they work uh, six and a half hours a day. So not as much as many of you. But uh, they have also two and a half hours of exercise, which is more than the average person on Earth. And also the exercise is quite a big deal to schedule because it's not that you have a gym with uh, 25 equipment, but you have to make sure that uh, if uh, A is running on the treadmill, B is not scheduled to run on the treadmill at the same time, but he can do something else, uh, uh, like the lifting weights uh, or Russians have the other equipment. Uh, if something is broken, again, you have to reshuffle uh, the exercise, but uh, um, for... Uh, for prevention, they, they have to do two and a half hours a day to, to make sure that when they come back to Earth, uh, their muscles are still functioning and they don't have problems. So the bars, uh, the top part are for the astronauts. The, the top, top part is generic information like uh, uh, what time is it? Uh, um, we use GMT uh, on board the station and then I put Munich because it's where I am so I can <laughs> just follow. Uh, TDRAS is the satellite coverage. So as a flight controller, you get a break uh, only when there is no green and no red line, which means in days like this, uh, you sit there and you say, oh crap, I will not uh, have a break for the next uh, six hours. <laughs> but of course you can uh, have one or two minutes of console. Um, top, top line is, as he said, day and night. Uh, depending on the beta angle, it can be longer or shorter. And all the second half, uh, it's information for ground controllers. So what you see called call, it's the activities we do in Columbus. So most of these things are uh, done by the actual flight controllers in the control room. Um, the first three bars are indicating some experiments ongoing. The green one is uh, uh, when we are supposed to activate a camera to watch the astronaut on board doing one experiment. So it's green, so the green experiment is what we are watching. All th there are more like 10 pages more going down on this that are illustrating what is happening in every module, what is uh, the Japanese flight controllers are doing, what NASA, um, this MCC cord is a coordination band between the control centers. So, you know, when uh, you have an activity that's, that is impacting other people that you have to tell them, and this is the time when this is happening. So, this is uh, very hard to prepare. And it's, uh, every day we revise three of these plans. The, the one is happening in seven days, in three days, and the day before. So every control center, every person is making sure that this is the best way of uh, uh, planning the activities, that they are sequenced correctly, that they're happening uh, in the right way. So what actually is done is very easy. You click on the activity and you get instructions. Of course, uh, astronauts are being trained, they are super good, uh, but they don't have memory for elephants, so they need to be reminded. And even with instructions, sometimes things are not happening the right way. 
So what you have when you click on each of those uh, activities, it's a procedure. So it's a list of instruction of how to set up uh, an experiment, uh, what to do, uh, which hardware you need. On top you have kind of a location pointer, so it's telling you I need the screwdriver, blah, blah, where can I find it? And if you can imagine there are thousands of tools and bags and things that have been put there years ago and how to dig into those things is quite a challenge. So 90% of the time, if you have a list of tools like this, uh, one or two is not in the right place, it's not in, so you have to be creative and try to figure out uh, where it was last time, uh, if it was used, uh, and uh, hopefully you will manage to do an experiment. It happens rarely that you cannot do it, but uh, normally on the ground you have an amazing support, so you always get uh, creative ways to complete all your activities. And sometimes for the most advanced experiment, we also have videos so they can uh, see what they have to do and just do it afterwards. Instruction for the astronauts are there, but also instruction for the ground. So whenever there is an activity in the ground part, the flight controller has the same. It has a procedure, it is using commanding, and on top of that, it has to, uh, a lot of other tools to check telemetry, status of the module, uh, what is happening, uh, if everything is running nominally, and uh, this is all uh, uh, trained and prepared, and. Uh, they're they are there to also respond to eventual anomalies. But uh, most of the time, you just run your procedures and your commands and uh, um, everything goes smooth. Of course, the time of work of the astronaut is very expensive. So you try to do the most you can from the ground. So if the astronaut has to use an experiment, you activate it remotely, you make it sure it's on, it's working, it's uh, checked out, and then the astronaut does the manual thing that you cannot do, of course, uh, like inserting the samples of the cells or moving some uh, uh, manual stuff. But you want to use them uh, as few as possible to make sure you can maximize the time and what they do. So Columbus, we have seen it from outside. This is the inside. Uh, I think somebody says it's a salad of cables or something very entertaining. But main point is it's a scientific laboratory. So I'm not going to list you all the things. Um, the important part is that uh, all the experiments are outfitted in standard racks which are these uh, rectangular shapes, and there are 16 of them. Of course, you can use uh, all the directions, so even the roof counts. And it's not uh, the roof in space, so it, it's quite uh, uh, 360 degrees. Uh, what we have is, uh, of course, mostly on the bottom equipment, like uh, pumps, uh, fans, uh, things to uh, work on scrubbing the atmosphere, uh, giving power to equipment, uh, so keeping the astronauts alive and everything running, lights, uh, cameras. And then we have the, the experiments which are listed on the left. To give you some example, uh, in Columbus you can do ultrasounds like we do on the ground. So there is a machine, you take the astronauts, you put it, him in there, and you scan it. Of course, this is something we don't want to see on the ground, so it's uh, recorded with the camera on board. There is a doctor in a specific location that is getting the medical part. We are not getting it. So we are just there for uh, troubleshooting the technical part, like the ultrasound is not powering up, what we can do. But uh, of course, I don't see naked astronauts <laughs> on a regular basis, at least. Um, you can do uh, electroencephalograms. You can do gym. 
actually the Mares, which should be on the left side in the third bay, and now is stored so you don't see it, is a very complicated chair that is measuring the ankle flexibility of the astronauts and the uh, bone strength. And then there are biological experiments on cells, uh, uh, fluid science. Uh, uh, there is an electromagnetic levitator, which is the second one from the left. So a lot of things going on. Uh, you have to consider the time allocated for astronaut to work on your experiment is based on uh, the, your contribu contribution to the entire program. So for the Europeans, it's, uh, I think, uh, around 1.5% of the total time. So you have to really be sure on uh, what, what you're doing and what's the priority of your activities. But mo most of the, uh, of course, the ones uh, involving human science, they can only be performed using the astronaut as a subject. But most of the top part of the experiments can be done uh, uh, with samples, so it's not that much of a time. At the moment, in the express rectory, we are growing red salad. Not going so well. It's a bit. They study was a bit too wet, but uh, uh, we are running the uh, electromagnetic levitator pretty much every day, and we will start with fluid science runs in, uh, in a week. So several things in parallel can happen. And every two or three weeks, we use uh, uh, ultrasounds and body measurements for the astronauts. So it's, it's quite used. <coughs> OK. <laughs> so uh, beside the how do you support the astronauts, there are several control centers. It's actually one for each partner and uh, a second one in the US for payload. So depending on what the activities that are ongoing, the astronauts are calling different call signs. Uh, Houston, of course, is the main for all the systems on the station. Huntsville is for payload operation. Moscow is for every Russian activity. Scuba is for activities in the Japanese module, and Munich for Columbus. So we are all spread around the world, and we talk to each other all the time to make sure we are all in sync with what is going on. And uh, what corresponds to this on the ground is this. So all pretty similar. Uh, Moscow is, uh, I've never seen them that full, but uh, there is normally one or two people, they work 24 hour shifts, so they're really uh, super <laughs> slow in answering. Houston, you have a full house. Huntsville, when payloads are ongoing, you have a full house, and Japanese as well. And Munich. So, it, of course, it's a team effort to support. So, we have different teams with different uh, uh, functionalities. Uh, uh, you have a dedicated position to talk to the astronauts, and this is the top left, is, they're called Eurocoms. They are the only ones, beside the, when they're not on console, the flight director, who can answer the messages. So they are trained to respond and to um, say whatever they are allowed by the flight director to say to the astronauts. And of course, all the rest of the position are the one feeding the information to them. So they are the voice, uh, but they get all the technicalities from the other positions. The EPIC are the planners. So you see in the logo the bars, they are the one taking care of the bars, making sure that things are happening. The, the star with uh, tools are the Cosmo. They are responsible for stowage. So they are the ones making sure that the screwdriver is somewhere in reach and explain and is there and uh, it has to be found. And especially they are the ones uh, in case uh, there is, the tools are not found, uh, they can guide through different solutions, so very creative. The Stratus, uh, so that was my former job, is the um, system engineer, so they control all the systems of the module, like uh, life support, uh, power system, uh, communication data, 
and uh, they are the only ones at the moment allowed to command, to, to send commands to the module. Uh, ground controllers, uh, those are really responsible for making sure that you receive all the telemetry, all the voice, all the data you need to do your job. So another very important one. And then on the bottom we have the engineering support team, which is kind of an offline team that is intervening in case you have anomalies and uh, taking uh, additional analysis. So the, the positions that are working 24 seven are the ground controllers, the stratos, and on top right you have the flight director which is kind of the master of the whole organization who makes sure things are running uh, properly. And in case decisions are needed, is the one taking responsibility for the decisions of cutting an activity, uh, using extra time, and uh, uh, of course is uh, making sure that the NASA part of uh, the station is informed on what we are doing. And last but not least, you have support for the science. So, the previous slide was all about controlling the module, but of course when I have a fluid science experiment running, I need to have the corresponding user center available that is responding on the science issues because we are not knowledgeable, so they are the ones knowledgeable in their experiment. And of course they operate the facility, so the, the inside level, which is not the power and the data, is operated by this uh, uh, control centers, and as you see, they are, in Europe we have a few, we have uh, some in Norway, Belgium, France, uh, uh, Holland, and they are not there all the time, but when their experiment is ongoing, they support 24-7, uh, and of course they support all the preparation. So they respond also to the flight director and so it's a, it's a quite a big of coordination effort if you think that you have your flight controllers in the room, the user centers, NASA, uh, payload, uh, so you have to coordinate quite a lot and there are few people involved. So finally this is uh, behind the scene. So this is what I see when I sit on console. So I can see telemetry, uh, this, this panel in the middle is a caution and warning. It's what is uh, waking you up uh, during the night where you're doing a night shift and trying to write some emails. And then you get beep and a yellow line, it means something is wrong and uh, that's what makes the job exciting. <laughs> it's not happening that often. <laughs> and then the bars, uh, I can look at some videos from the other control centers and of course on top I have uh, the view of the station cameras and uh, everything that is going on. So with that I hope uh, Columbus, uh, flight director, Stratos is making a bit more sense. It's actually a very cool job and uh, um, I hope uh, you can visit any time in Munich the, the control center and some of you will have the options to work in this project because Despite being quite old, it's still very interesting and it changes every day. So you go there very relaxed and hope you have an easy day. And then the toilet breaks and uh, it, the madness starts. So never a quiet moment. <laughs>